Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast, where we explore cutting edge strategies to keep teams human centered, drive innovation, and empower you with the tools and insights needed to help your team excel and thrive in today's rapidly changing world. Your host is Dan Grunebel, a seasoned expert with over 20 years of experience in enhancing team dynamics and innovation. This week on the podcast, we're delighted to feature John Estefanis, an expert enhancing team resilience and culture. As the founder and CEO, John leads RallyBright, a SaaS performance management platform blending behavioral science with data analytics. RallyBright provides tailored professional development tools, reflecting John's focus on innovative team building and enhancing organizational dynamics. Tune in to learn three essential takeaways that offer practical research-backed insights into building stronger teams. First, uncover the often overlooked concept of a team's collective purpose. While the focus frequently lands on company or individual purpose, understanding and nurturing a team's shared purpose is crucial as it forms the backbone of organizational success. Second, they'll explore the science behind team dynamics with insights into research-driven factors contributing to team failures, and John will reveal the primary indicators that predict a team's success. Third, they'll explore the importance of assessing how different teams collaborate and perform together. Understanding the dynamics of how teams operate together or where they fall short is critical to fostering a productive and harmonious work environment. So, teamwork makes the dream work, and we're here to inspire your next collaborative breakthrough. Gather your team or put on your headphones, and let's dive in together. Welcome to the Future of Teamwork podcast. My name is Dane Grunewald, CEO of the Huddle3 Group. And today I'm joined by John Estefanis. John is the founder and CEO of RallyBright. And uh, he and I have been introduced through a, a, a mutual acquaintance and it's been a, a great start to our relationship. So I'm looking forward to sharing more of John's story with all of you. Uh, welcome to the show, John. Thanks, Dane. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm a huge fan and excited to be uh, to be here today. Yeah, it's cool. I've... Uh, I've had a lot of fun learning more about RallyBright and and what's equally as exciting as the platform, which we'll talk to today, is is kind of your story and how you came to decide to start building the platform. So maybe you can share a little bit more of your sort of origin story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it, it's I would say it's more of an evolutionary story than an origin story, so to speak. Um, so so RallyBright, just for context, is a team intelligence and performance platform that helps you measure, diagnose, and improve your team performance and your team dynamics and, and other areas around high-performing teams. And the way I got into it or evolved into creating this organization is just through my own personal history. Um, started out when I was a young child, always sneaking down to the basement to program computer games with my brother. Um, and then in undergraduate and law school, I, um, I was actually building hospital management systems where I really learned about the power of data um, and how when you actually track um, pre-treatment or pre-intervention, intervention, and then post-intervention outcomes, you get a longitudinal view of how, in this case, a patient is performing. Um, but across the spectrum of, of the business world, how organizations, individuals, and teams are performing. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned I went to law school. Um, I, I like to joke, I made the mistake of going to law school because I never really wanted to practice once I got there. Um, and during my last uh, semester, I actually um, wrote a business plan for a business planning or a, a, a business course at law school. And I was like, wait, this is a great idea. I'm going to go do this. Um, so I started my first company right out of law school with the um, with the under enough self awareness to understand that I preferred computers to lawyers, and um, it was a dot com idea in early two thousand. Obviously, that didn't work out because we all know what happened later. Um, but it turned into a um, software company and a marketing agency, and this was me right out of school, and built an amazing team of incredibly motivated, uh, you know, colleagues. And we did what the world never expected us to do. We built and sold to big brands and ultimately sold the company. And then that was the next stage of the evolution, which was, hey, John, now you're the uh, CTO of a 45-person technology department at a marketing agency with a 37% attrition rate. Go fix it. Ooh. So that was um, that was kind of, it, it, it was somewhat shocking, but of course it was a huge challenge. And the first thing I did was I Googled, like, what does the CTO for a marketing agency do? Or like... <laughs> There's no playbook. There, there, there's nothing out there. So I hopped on a plane. I met everybody. We fixed it. And then I went to a bigger organization where 
all of a sudden I had, uh, we scaled from 100 to 400 people with teams around the world that were all reporting to different P&Ls. And this was how do we drive digital transformation for a global agency? Um, once again, the same the same issue. There's there's no clear cut playbook for all of this. Um, without going into too much detail, what it really came down to the foundation of Rally Bright was when when I decided I wanted to do more of what filled my soul versus kind of what what I had been doing. It really came down to three things. It it, it was technology, teams, and people. Um, and ultimately, um, how do you create a framework to empower every leader or every manager to build a high performing team? And what are the principles that drive that? Yep. And yeah, at my first company, I was very fortunate. My, my, our founding partner was actually one of my first customers and she was an embedded executive psychologist at Microsoft oh. uh, for over 18 years. Yeah. Um, and we yeah. built some team tools and I, my, my thought was let's build a SaaS platform around this and. Let's give every manager, every leader, every HR department, every L&D professional, every talent management professional uh, a framework and a technology platform that can help scale building high-performing teams. That's so neat. So many great points to dive into. It's a, I love the way you framed it as an evolution. That you can sort yeah. of see that sort of growth. And before the show, um, you talked a lot about, you actually talk, mentioned the term fall up. We were talking yeah. about people being in teams and whether they fall out of teams and you said they fall up. So you had some great examples there of falling up through your different moves too. Yeah, it's it, it's been an interesting journey and a lot of it comes down to throughout that journey, how do the managers really or the leaders really build yeah. teams and people so they can go on to bigger and better things? Yeah. No, that lens of the leader is important. It's come up a couple of times in conversations this week because yeah. a lot of people will often talk about company's purpose and they'll talk about engaging employees, but they didn't talk about the role of the leader and the team, which both seem to be more sort of central to the, the organization's ecosystem. So I think you're really, you're closer to where the real magic's happening there. Yeah, and if you think about it, um... Who do you work with the most on a daily basis? We've we've all heard the uh, you know the, the 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 phrases of you spend more time at work than with your family and yeah you know the, you know um, at, at, at the end of the day it's it's not just about the company you work at it's with the people that you work with every single day to achieve that common business purpose which is you yeah. know Google's definition of a team a group of professionals that rely on each other to achieve a common business purpose so yeah. so there, there's a huge influence there and the and the person that's going to influence that relationship the most is going to be the manager and management as we know is different than leadership but when managers become better leaders they build better teams that's just logical and true and the data shows that yeah absolutely and i i couldn't help but miss when you said you got on better with uh computers than lawyers i've heard some bad lawyer jokes but that <laughs> That's a great I'm statement. Just, listen, I have a lot of friends that are lawyers. I respect <laughs> the profession. I think we've got a great team of lawyers working with us. But um, at, at, at the end of the day, you have to understand like where are your superpowers and where's your kryptonite, right? And yeah. um, looking at law books wasn't wasn't, wasn't where I was for at. You. Me neither. I actually tried to do law myself, and the library scared me away. Um, it's a scary place. It is, yeah. And I was with, a literature major in undergrad, but the law library was a bit different. Yeah, yeah. heavy, heavy. Yeah. What's interesting as you shared that story, John, of the 45 person team after you sold your business yep. and, and how you got on a plane and went and met people and fixed that. Um, I want to dive into that a little bit more today, but, but actually the next job really caught my ear when you explained you had, you went from a hundred people to 400 people in a global organization. You're running yep. technology um, as a function and those individuals report up to different P and L. So just the whole concept and construct of team there must have been really stretched through through that journey. Yeah, yeah, it's you know there 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 are so many different ways of looking at teams, right? And that was truly, um, I, I would say, drinking from a fire hose, right? You're talking yeah. global organization, you're talking about functional practice areas within broader geographic P and Ls. Um, you're talking about multiple missions and purposes and objectives for each one of those teams. Like, how do we elevate everybody but still deliver what we need to for our specific 
functional goals. Um, yeah. So uh, t- to me, it was really, really interesting. And 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 candidly, the, the the first approach to that was like, what's our purpose? What are we trying to accomplish together? Yeah. Um, that each manager and each team can contribute to. So um, yeah, it was it it, it 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 was remote. It was hybrid. It was matrixed. It was geographically dispersed. All of those things, and and you know, you have to start with the right foundational elements to get everybody aligned, and then actually working together with strong dynamics to yeah. achieve that performance. Yeah. And when you touch on that, you know, starting with a purpose for that group, was it the company purpose at that stage, or was it the purpose for the technology function that you were leading, or how did where did you position that? Yeah, I mean, it all starts with the organizational purpose, right? Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, whatever your organization is employing you to do or asking you to lead has to align with the overall organizational mission, right? And then I yeah. think it, it's it's really around how do you define your 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 functional or your team purpose um, around what's going to complement and enable and accelerate the overall mission. So, not technology, or in this case, you know, digital transformation just for the sake of digital transformation, but to elevate the organizational goals. And yeah. then it becomes, how do we do that, right? Do we need to create the systems, the process, the people bring in the right people? Yeah. Um, how do we work with other parts of the organization? How do we understand how the organization sells to customers so we can accelerate that or lift the tide for everybody versus yeah. just creating a silo? Yeah, that's neat. And I've heard, uh, and I talk about it a lot on this show, the Dan Pink introduced it to me, whether it was originally his work or not, the big P, little P construct, which is there's yep. the company purpose and then there's the individual purpose. Yeah. But, but you're essentially introducing team purpose in between that. So maybe there's three Ps. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would say there should be a team purpose, right? Yeah. Um, because ultimately you want to align individual purposes to the organizational purpose. And that's kind of like the middleware. And I'm not going to get technical about it, but essentially no, like that's that. the translation mechanism, right? Yeah. It, how do we support you as an individual to achieve your goals and grow within the organization? Yeah. How do we support our team goals to ultimately drive those company goals? Um, yeah. I think it's really important to be thinking about that. And we found, so, so it's one of the um, dimensions that we measure on the platform is direction. And that's all about what is the team's shared purpose and vision and how does that align with the organizational shared purpose and vision? And yeah. we have a little exercise, which is, you know, build a team, lead a business, you know? So your team might be the senior leadership team for an operating unit within an organization. It might be a team that's, for, you know, building product, but ultimately you need to know what you're doing that for and how it aligns with the customers, the company and the, how it fulfills the individuals. Yeah. And that lead, that build a team, lead a business concept. So is that trying to almost empower each team in a business to, you know, act like an owner? We hear a lot of people say, you know, employ an ownership mindset. So are they thinking about leading the business of their function versus the business of the wider organization? Yeah. Um, I, it, it starts at the, 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 the function, right? Like, yeah. because we want to make sure that we have agency and accountability within Got our it. team yeah. to actually achieve the goals that we're setting out. Right. Like, so we, we talk a lot about how do you measure performance on a team? Oftentimes we're looking at spreadsheets, right? We're looking yeah. at P and L's or we're looking at time cards or we're looking at, you know, OKR platforms or whatever. Um, but, but at the end of the day, when we look at performance on a team, what we're really looking at is, are we clear on our objectives? Yeah. Does everybody have ownership and accountability and commitment to one another as a team? And are we measuring ourselves in a way that we all agree on as a team and meeting our commitments with a bias for action? I like that. No, it's, um, it's a different lens, but they all filter into the same objectives, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Because you do see a lot of teams deploy OKRs, but, you know, being clear on objectives, you know, people can run out and set their own OKRs that excite them and impress the boss, but it doesn't necessarily yeah. get the team aligned on an objective. Yeah. And then as far as the ownership and accountability, it's not necessarily something that is shared at a team level. It might be, I've seen a lot of OKRs deployed where an individual is chasing their their piece yep. or a function's doing it. Um without thinking about customers. 
Yeah. So, so you can get into a lot of trouble if you don't have that alignment. I, I think it's really important because, you know, most of what we all do is a team sport, whether we like it or not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. it's, you know, business is a team sport. Any, any function that you look at is, is a team sport. It's very rare that you find an individual that operates alone in an ivory tower yeah. and that's how they're held accountable and that's how they help others. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There may be a few examples in the like deep R and D scientific world um, where there's someone who's just off the charts, but that, there's often a team that they're coming back into, a, as autonomous as they may be. <laughs> yep, and then they should still be held accountable to others, and others have teams, and mm -hmm. that's kind of ultimately what it comes down to. Is it's it, it's very rare that we never see it, but obviously we're somewhat biased in terms of the folks that we talk to because yeah, we are a team platform. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you're you're in your own um, world. You you kind of it's a friend of mine the other day said, "I'm living on a very different algorithm to you," and I'd never thought that I was living on an algorithm, but th there there it is again. It's it, it yeah. We we won't go there, but I I, I agree with your friend. We all have our own algorithms that we follow, for sure, for sure. Um, so the other point that you made in your introduction, John, was your. I think you said first customer and and was it co-founder also who'd been a, yeah, yeah. One, a one psychologist of our first, at Microsoft? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was um so so at that very first company I started right out of law school, we were building team assessments and um, individual 360 assessment tools for 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 our partner who um who was using them at Microsoft, which was kind of cool that we had Microsoft as a customer, yeah. right? Like as a startup right out of school. Um and, um, you know, what I really learned from that is um, the importance of having a framework, right? Like, obviously, you learn that when you're building medical systems, because that's just how things are done. What we learned is by tracking diagnosis, treatment, and, um, you know, the various codes that are all associated with that, we could extract data around productivity, around billing, around clinical outcomes, all, all sorts of really, really interesting things. And really all they wanted was, how do we collect data? How do we get patients through the system faster, right? But at the end of the day, it's, okay, we're doing this many more of these types of procedures. We're seeing this many more types of patients. This is how the outcomes are being driven by the types of interventions that we're doing. So, so learning about the fact that there were frameworks around the people side and specifically frameworks around the team side, I think it's absolutely critical because most organizations aren't measuring teams the same way that they're attempting to measure overall engagement with their engagement surveys or individual performance with performance reviews. Um, and, and I think that's a huge gap because, you know, as we, we, we've been talking about, and once again, understanding our own bias here, um, you know, teams are the core business drivers for most organizations, but the, most organizations don't have a framework to say without bias and without kind of the filtered views of the leaders, how are teams doing collectively? And what are themes that we're seeing in our organization? And how do we measure this in a way that's um, giving us longitudinal data so we can optimize how we bring people together, how we enforce their working relationships, how we track their uh, non-spreadsheet performance? Um, because that's a huge driver, I think, for all of the things that companies are doing now around engagement, around individual performance, around business outcomes. What yep. have you? Yeah, and and even um, in today's age, particularly if you're a heavy customer facing organization, there's that whole community engagement and and relations, which is becoming bigger and bigger. We're seeing that with a lot of big brands getting canceled or getting yeah. a big following because they have a better environmental sustainability footprint. That yeah. a lot of these things are off spreadsheets too. Yeah, no, of course, and 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 what you I think what you're what you're alluding to is this this concept of is a team adaptable what is their outside in focus like do they understand their customers um are they hearing what's happening in the market um we've seen candidly a steady erosion in adaptability across teams over the last couple of years um there are really i think two primary drivers of that um yep. one is at the beginning of the COVID pandemic teams became a lot more siloed their, the connection rates on teams actually went up pretty significantly because people were more empathetic with the people that they work with every day. And a lot of those relationships got stronger. Huh. As we're coming out of COVID, um, we're finding that those, those silos have actually, um, they, they've created it a little bit, har a harder environment 
for teams to work with other teams. Other teams. Yeah. yeah. And that connective tissue between teams has deteriorated somewhat as we've dealt with fully remote, hybrid, now return to office. The, the culture of being able to walk down the hall or have a lunchroom conversation with somebody who's not on your team at another department. So we always joke, there's always been friction between things like sales and marketing or yeah. product and engineering or finance and everybody, right? But at the <laughs> end of the day, at the end of the day, a lot of times those relationships, there, there were these unspoken ways of working together to get through those disconnects, right? Whether it's picking up the phone, walking down the hall or seeing somebody at lunch, right? Yeah. Um, so that adaptability is, so, so, so that was the first driver of kind of the adaptability um, erosion. The, the second is just the rate of disruption. It's been nonstop, as we all know, over the last three years Yeah. Um, with, with all the things that we mentioned. And there's a lot of fatigue. And I think there's a lot of um, narrowing of the aperture to like, what do I need to do to accomplish my goals today? Versus who do I need to be speaking to and getting feedback from and building relationships with yeah. to accomplish our goals for the future? Yeah. They're two, they're two uh, themes I think that any business owner can or, or any leader of an HR or people function can uh, associate with very easily right now. Yeah. And, and visually, that, that siloing effect that you talk about that, that kind of erodes some of the, the connective tissue between teams I can totally see that in businesses yeah. that, that we operate in businesses that we support. You've seen that strengthening of the individual team at the cost of yeah. the, the, the teams in the ecosystem. And that can have some really, um, it, that gets compounded by your second point on the rate of disruption because most disruption isn't singular in its function, right? right. Most disruption comes across the customer and, and all of those functions, engineering, sales, marketing. And so when that change is happening, if each of those groups is really firm and rigid on, hey, this is how we operate, this is what we do, we love each other, but we, yeah. we don't have quite as much time for you, um, that, that just causes probably a lot more of this burnout that we're seeing where, where people just constantly feel like they're being asked to do new stuff, but it's not what they want to do and they're in all sorts yeah. of meetings. It, it all just kind of builds. Yeah. And, and burnout is another one of those things that, that's very real. I mean, you see it now with the, the, the increased focus on individual well-being or employee well-being. Um, we've actually, while, while connection spiked at the beginning of the pandemic, we're actually now seeing what we call a, a barbell effect on connection on teams. And this oh, is right. something I think every leader needs to be cognizant of is, sure, you may have made it through this together, but now we tend to have groups of people that are very close and groups of new people that are coming in trying to navigate, how do I build connections on teams in a remote hybrid world? Um, but then the burnout is also causing some of those folks that have kind of been through the past several years of disruption to start to disengage and start to fall off. So, so we end up seeing very clear clusters of um, strength of connections on teams. Some, you know, you can have a team of 10 people, six of them may feel very connected and aligned four of them may be struggling. And, you know, once again, it's the power of data that helps you kind of get beyond that um, without having to ask, like, how are you feeling today? But asking more about how is the connection on our team? Do we have psychological safety? Do we have trust on the team? Um, are we handling conflict appropriately? By being able to get to the behaviors that drive connection, and that's part of what we do on Rally Bright is we, we are behavioral science-based. Um, understanding what's happening with your team members without calling them out. But once again, looking at the team as a collective is, is really, really important. Yeah. And I saw um, one of your team members had made a post which you'd, you'd liked on, uh, on conflict. And um, I love the way you broke down the three types of conflict. I think it was relationship, process, and task. Uh, and, and it sounds like what your data is allowing teams – and both macro and micro within the organization and, and at large in our um, society, it's it's a leading indicator. It's saying, hey, this is coming. The conflict's there. If you don't start addressing it or creating that psychological safety in these teams that are that are kind of a little bit stuck, yeah. that, that the real damage is yet to be seen. Yeah, and I, I would say not just stuck, but one of the things we're seeing on a lot of the uh, executive teams or senior leadership teams is folks are a lot crispier. 
and I use that term crispy as a, it's, it's, it's something we use in the platform, but um, the thought is we're, we're all trying to do more with less, right? And we're all Got under it. the gun and we're all dealing with macroeconomic and geopolitical and all sorts of other things. Yes. So people are getting a little bit crispier. And I think oftentimes what organizations or, or this is something I learned very, um, you know, and it was, it, it was a key learning for me is conflict is not a bad thing in business. Yeah. In fact, conflict, if it's handled well and productively, is a driver of innovation, creativity, and new ways of problem solving, yep. right? And first, we have to segment what type of conflict are we encountering, but then as we move towards that resolution, are we not damaging relationships and are we not making things personal? Yeah. Because when we can do that, look, it, it, it's funny. I was just listening to a podcast from um, Frank Slootman, with Frank Slootman, the, the, the CEO of Snowflake, and he was basically saying, when you hire a great team, you want them pulling you. You want to be holding on to the reins, not pulling the cart. Yeah. And when you have that happening, there's going to be conflict. Yeah. There's going to be kind of clashing and that's expected, whether it's between departments or between individuals. But that's where the real magic happens when you're able to say like, okay, this is about the issue. It's not about the person. And if we solve this collectively, we're all going to be better off for it. Because usually what's happening when there's conflict is difference of opinion, difference of approach, different of process, difference of process. But the people that are usually bringing their points of view to bear, they're there yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's the delivery you have to get beyond it. We actually have a tool in the platform as well that focuses around how do you understand your own conflict style and how do you look at the team conflict style? Yeah. Because there are different, just like there are different, you know, uh, psychology personas uh, or psychometric personas, there are different conflict styles. Like I am an enforcer problem solver. The first thing I'm going to want to do is figure out what the solution is and go for it. But then I'm going to want to dive a bit deeper. Uh -huh. um, we have another conflict type called a problem solver peacekeeper. If everybody on the team is a problem solver peacekeeper, you're going to spend a lot of time yeah. digging into the root cause and then trying to get everybody on board. Yeah. And just being aware of that. And I guess there's different that's really interesting on conflict styles. There's different learning opportunities that come from the combination. We talked a lot, a bit about leaders earlier and the importance of a leader on a team. But if, if a leader's style um, is to be more that, that peacekeeping problem solver, then the rest of the team maybe gets stuck on all of the root cause analysis and isn't learning about how to jump in and fix things quickly. So it's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, the, the the number nine lowest behavioral indicator that we have in terms of a team's vulnerability, like so the, 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 the number nine vulnerability for most teams is that they yeah. often get stuck over analyzing issues yeah. and failing to move forward. Yeah. Right? And, I've often um, said that to friends. Sometimes it's better to make the wrong decision than a slow decision. Exactly. And then, and candidly, number five is we don't surface and resolve pro uh, conflict in a productive way. Yeah. So when you see how these things begin to overlay, you you can start to say like, okay, how do I start to address these things? Let's you know there there's the 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 Bezos disagree and commit right. Yeah. Um, at some point, the quicker you can get to that disagree and commit, depending on the level of decision, the better you are at being able to adapt to what's happening to the world outside you. And I think no. that's great. Now that you've given me two of the nine, I'm intrigued. I want to hear what the other seven are. <laughs> so what's the top one? Have you got them there? Um, well, 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 the the lowest ranking is um, team members don't understand how uh, other teams are executing on their agendas, how, how our team enables other teams to execute on their agenda. So once okay. again, it's that how does our purpose ladder into the purpose of other teams within the organization? It's the middle P, I'm going to call it. I like yeah, that. I like that. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm not going to go through the whole list, but um, you know, decision follow through, productive meetings, um, internal focus, um, uh, candidly, they tend to focus more around some of those connection personality issues. And that's one of the reasons we incorporated psychometrics into the platform because teams are made up of people and the better we understand ourselves first yeah. and others, yeah. the better we can perform collectively. Um, so at, at, at the end of the day, there are some around connection, but most of the areas where teams are struggling is around this adaptability area. Yeah. Um, and that's something that we're just seeing pretty, pretty clearly through the data and through just, you know, qualitative experiences with, with folks and having conversations like this with, with leaders.
Yeah, that's neat. And adaptability keeps coming up. So I want to dive into that. Um, There's there's a lot of great guests we have on the show that come in and talk about the way that we do work is is broken and that we've made work really burdensome and not fun and and very rigid. Um, And I've personally got some stories and experiences like that. You know, earlier in my career, I was lucky to keep falling up into roles where I'd get into a team and we had a whole lot to do and it was just like, Dane, go and do it. So I got to, you know, work out visa and immigration processes, work out background and drug checks for people that were in Africa when I'm trying to deploy them to, wow. you know, Australia, um, build partnerships uh, in different regions so that I could support my teams when they were deployed to countries where I wasn't. So I got to do all of this cool stuff. And that was because the business was growing. And then in larger organizations, well, there's a department that does that and there's a role that does that. So your job is just make a lot of calls and get more customers on the phone. So you kind of start to get siloed. And I think think that hyper-specialization of roles that we've seen in a lot of growing organizations and technology's played its part there too has actually impacted i've always thought at an individual level adaptability but absolutely from what you're sharing here it's impacting adaptability at a team level too because there's all of this systems tools process which is designed to be repeatable and not broken and not messed with yeah and the 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 question is it's a balance right like you're always going to have the balance um you know and and another vulnerability that we've seen is that the team's not experimenting enough Mm-hmm. And in order to actually successfully experiment, you have to have the right environment. You have to have the right process. You have to be able to say, okay, instead of falling up, let's fail forward. Like let's yeah. run experiments, let's time box them, let's set clear objectives, and then let's make sure that we're we're learning and growing from the experience. Yeah. So that fits directly into what we talk about between high performing teams and resilient teams, so to speak, yep. because our product is called resilient teams. And that means a team is able to engage with adversity, um, rebound from setbacks quickly, um, sustain performance through disruption and learn and grow from the experience. So yep. there are components of having a growth mindset, not just at the individual level, but at the team level. And in order to have that mindset, you have to have that foundation of safety and you know belonging and the fact that we are going to create an environment where it's okay to try new things within constraints right but but to to learn and grow from them because ultimately it's 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 like conflict if you do this right it's gonna elevate your game that's a big unlock i'm gonna get you to repeat those four john so you said engage with adversity rebound from rebound from setbacks setbacks Sustain then, performance through disruption yep. and learn and grow from the experience. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that model. We had a guest on the show, Luke Williams, who's a professor up at NYU Stern. He wrote the book Disrupt. And I've been referencing him a lot lately from the conversation I had with him because it it created his his approach to ideas and teams being encouraged to play with ideas and experiment, to use your word. Um was was a way of saying, hey, in this world of disruption, we just talked about that earlier, the only way you can stay ahead of it or, or create your own disruption is that if you're constantly experimenting and look for ways that others, outsiders may break what's great about your product or your service or your customer experience. So he's doing that through his idea skills platform. But okay. there's a lot of symmetry there and, it, and it's driving the right... Um, the invitation, I think, is the really important part. It's an invitation for teams to become resilient. It's not, hey, you know, if you want to be resilient, go into the gym and do a hundred press ups every Tuesday and then go swim. It's it's like let's let's actually play as a team. So I like I like that the way that you frame that. Yeah, and it's it, it's it's having once again it's it's having that agency and commitment and accountability of the team as as a group to be able yeah. to do that. Um, and I think also just having the right foundations, right? Like, and obviously measuring what matters, but in order for a team to truly hit its objectives, they have to be working as a team. That's kind of like step one. Yeah. And that's why you have to look at the people side as well as the process side. Um, I, I love the analogy that our, our friends over at uh, Contemporary Leadership Advisors has shared with us. And we use this in our trainings is, you know, 
do you want your team to be graphite or do you want your team to be a diamond? Because they're both made of the same molecules, carbon, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's really about how they're connected to one another. And graphite's crispy. Graphite, graphite's a little bit crispy. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and it's yeah. layered and it's stacked. And whereas you want the matrix, right? Um, no, but I totally agree with you. My, it's funny when you mentioned crispy earlier and you talk about resilience. Now, my dad's always been a big proponent of what he calls staying in the elastic zone. He's like, yeah. the elastic zone's where you and the team need to be. And once you go outside of that, well, it's plastic and you know, you, you push too far and there's breakage, there's damage for, for you personally, for your team, for yeah. your customers. And I think it's a good way to be visually thinking about teams, uh, particularly yeah. getting away from spreadsheets, like you said earlier. Yeah. yeah. And understanding what are the characteristics of that elasticity that you're looking for, right? Yeah. Like, I think that's really important. Like, do we want a wide rubber band, a narrow rubber band? Like, you know, do we want something that can flex and grow and what are the parameters for that? I think it's really important, but it, it's all about enabling the team to operate as a high performing individual, but as a collective, as a team. And that's all yeah. the things you want in leaders you want out of the team as a group. Yeah, no, that's neat. So with your platform, as I've um, come to become more familiar with it, which has been awesome, uh, you've got these team vulnerabilities that you've mentioned and, and you you'll operate in sprints. So as I look at it, you're creating this framework um, for the team to be doing what's important to them in like their day job, but also to be growing as a team and working on some of those interactions and accountabilities and, and goal setting opportunities. Yeah. Where, where do you see as that starts to happen in the organizations where you're having success, um, where do you see that sort of taking teams in the future? Is, is that... Uh, going to redefine sort of role design and team composition? Is it going to take teams into um, expanding the, the capabilities of their functions? Are, are there particular sort of outcomes that that's starting to lead into? Yeah. I mean, for, first and foremost, it's around how do we create the healthiest, highest performing and inclusive teams possible, right? Like, so how do we get all of our managers upskilled to the point where they understand what it means to be a good leader and have a framework by which they can measure how they're doing and how their how their teams are doing there is that elasticity component to it as well as like how do we define teams and how do we actually look at team relationships interdependently within an organization but also between individuals so so i think there are some some opportunities there as well um, in terms of the overall function and roles of the teams those are generally set by you know the external org charts and whatnot um, but what we have found is there are ways to identify where our teams operating much stronger. What are the strengths of our organization as a whole that we want to reinforce? What are the vulnerabilities that are creeping up that are maybe cultural canaries in the coal mine or performance canaries in the coal mine across an organization? And where have we addressed these strengths? Where have we doubled down on these strengths effectively? And where have we addressed the vulnerabilities effectively? So I think that's kind of the baseline for, for individual managers or individual teams um, and leaders. What we found is that elasticity is critical because guess what? Every, every quarter or every four to six months, we're going to get a pulse on where we are and we want our, just like anything, we want our numbers to go up and to the right. Um, but we also want our connections to be stronger, our alignment to be stronger. And we also have to understand that our vulnerabilities can and should change. Yes. So what we're working on now is going to be different than what we need to work on next. So I think about one customer, and this is probably the most basic example, but every year as we've worked with them, like in the bottom 10 of all their teams was we have unproductive meetings. And for the first year ever, it was like, hey, our meetings are not in the bottom 10. All of our scores have come up, which means that vulnerability is now a strength. Like we're having productive, more effective meetings. Seems basic, but you think about what that means to the several hundred people that are in meetings every day and the amount of time that's being spent and the outcomes of those meetings, like that can, that translates directly to the bottom line in those performance metrics that we all want to measure on our spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I, I think there's the creating a framework to look at not just performance, but the, the behavioral components and the people components and the cultural components of what makes a team great, but then also learning, adapting, and stretching against that as well. Yeah. And so we've talked a couple of times 
on sort of leading indicators, which your data will start to show. Um, and I'm hearing that again there. But but something that, that just popped up new was you mentioned maybe mapping the wider organization for some hotspots, whether that's a gap or it's a strength. Um, that's really interesting because in a fast changing world, we don't always know what we want or why we want it. Sometimes you kind of got to just stumble across something, a jam, and, yeah. and then try and expand it. So are you seeing, as you look at multiple teams within an organization on platform, that there is this kind of next practice, best practice identification that, that starts to emerge? Absolutely. And it's one of the things we love partnering with um, our HR partners on within organizations, because um, obviously you can't give somebody like me a whole bunch of data and say, don't aggregate it, don't slice and dice it, don't look at it different <laughs> ways. So one yeah. of the first things we did when we started working with multiple teams, and you know, we, we've had organizations where we've had over 60 VP level and above teams all yeah. using the platform, right? And yeah. that's, just, that's a goldmine of context and data to take action on. So, so being able to, to roll that data up to understand where are the hotspots, which teams are struggling. More importantly, how do we empower every leader to achieve their highest potential yeah. with their team and create the best environment for their team, right? Yeah. So, so being able to see not just what's happening across the organization, but how, are, how does that map to what's happening with an individual team? And how does that, how do we approach the leader and the team in the right way? Yes. To help them achieve change and growth. That's that's where the real power comes from when you start looking at things holistically across an organization. And then there's the longitudinal view as well. Like, are we achieving the right outcomes? And yeah. that's where we'll tie back to, you know, all of the spreadsheet metrics and show the ROI and all that other good stuff is when teams are high performing, they deliver better results. You know, McKinsey's yeah. done studies on it. HBR has done studies on it. Like, we all know that data is out there, but it is... And for executive teams, it's critical. We we know that when the executive team is working well together, mm -hmm. they're going to achieve 190% better financial results for the organization. Like 190 is a big number. It's a big number. When yeah. the top team is aligned and high performing, I think that's from a Deloitte study. Um, yeah, yeah their, their, their organization is going to achieve better results. We know high performing teams just in general deliver 50% better uh, business outcomes overall than, than just non-performing teams or not yeah. high performing teams. So it's all there. We all know it intuitively. We just haven't measured it, right? Yes. And the problem I was trying to solve by creating RallyBright was... Um, and I'll, I, I use this example is as a global executive, I had insights and relationships with each of my team leaders and I could get a pulse by having my one-on-ones, mm -hmm. but I'm always going to have bias, whether I like it or not, I'm human and I have a relationship with an individual and I'm always going to get a filtered view. Yeah. So while things may look great and the numbers may show things are looking great, what's really happening on the ground in the team? There's never been an empirical way to measure that. No. So all of a sudden, with the newborn, I was spending two months in Singapore fixing a problem that was caused by something external. Yes. But had we had that canary in the coal mine, we could see there, there's conflict with these other departments. This is what's happening with customers. This is what's happening with the relationships on the team, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's really what it is. It's how do we make better decisions? And our, our, our friends at CLA in their, in their book, uh, what is it? The End of Leadership as We Know It, yeah. um, they, they like don't use data as a trap. Right, data without judgment is one thing that that can be a trap for most executives. Absolutely, yeah, because you can easily dive in and use it for whatever you want to, or get yeah. stuck doing all that root cause analysis that you mentioned earlier. Exactly, if if you're a problem solver, peacekeeper, that's gonna happen. No, I feel like we could have kept talking for at least another couple of hours here, John. I I love the energy, and I love not only the. Um, the the insight and the ideas that you bring, but just the practical wisdom that, that okay. you guys have built into the platform and that you've you've seen uh, deploy in your own team. So uh, that's that's been a joy to be engaging with for me, and I'm sure for our listeners. Um, yeah. a, a couple of key takeaways, like what I really love is the way that you've you've defined that middle purpose. That, you know, there's the organizational purpose, the individual purpose, but the purpose of teams. Yeah. Um, I really love the way that you talk about resiliency in teams and driving adaptability in particular, yeah. because we, you know, to your points on, you know, teams becoming disconnected and and uh, increasing rate of disruption. That that adaptability is critical for any business. 
And then that third piece, um, which is really all about the leading indicator. Like we've got enough data if we ask the right questions, if we get the teams to hold each other accountable, we can start to have a better view of what challenges and opportunities lie ahead and stop being so reactive. So there were a few themes that I really heard today and and going back to what you shared with me at the beginning of the show, that there is no playbook or guidebook for teamwork and, and right. you, you and the team seem to be a long way down the path in in uh, solving for that problem. Yeah, well, our, our mission is to make teamwork better better for everybody and whatever we can do to help there, we're, we're going to do it. Yeah. It's awesome. It's a great mission. So thanks for uh, taking the time, John. And if our uh, listeners want to uh, reach out and get a demo on Rally Bride or, or find out more about uh, Contemporary Leadership Associates or, or any of your other partners, how do they best yeah. find you? Yeah, just reach out at John at Rally Bright um, or go to our website, uh, rallybright.com. And I'm always on LinkedIn too, so I'd love to connect on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, I recommend it. So uh, I'll look forward to staying in touch. All right. Thank you, Dan. Really appreciate being here. Thanks, John. Thank you for joining us. Remember that by embracing vulnerability, trusting our intuition, and approaching challenges with compassion, we not only strengthen our teams, but also pave the way for a future where collaboration thrives. If you're hungry for more insights, strategies, and research on collaboration, head over to thefutureofteamwork.com. There, you can join our mailing list to stay updated with the latest episodes and get access to exclusive content tailored to make your team thrive. Together, we can build the future of teamwork. Until next time.